So um, I'm going to talk to you about interviews, but there's a little run up to interviews, isn't there? There's being ready for it. Um, and I take it all of you here are still in training. None of you are consultants yet. I think that nobody, nobody put their hand up earlier. So if you're in a training post, you need to make sure that your competence, you're, you're competent to be appointed to a consultant. So at least a year before your final ARCP, you need to make sure you are well on track. Okay? You're here presumably because you've just got your fellowship. Well, and some of you will be ST6, some of you will be ST7, maybe some of you will be ST8. But you need to be well on track to completing. Because within six, month, within six months of your CCT date, your <coughs> TPD will be checking your ISCP portfolio and making sure you're on track. So you need to be up to date. And I know that some people are better than others at uploading stuff onto the ISCP. And not only will your TPD be checking that, but your SAC liaison rep, in other words, the external person who comes into your ARCPs, will also be checking, because the JCST have to sign off your application as well. So make sure, particularly if you're in your final year, but actually all the time, that your ISCP is always up to date. So when you get your outcome six, your TPD will then write a report. The SAC liaison rep, or in some specialties, the chair of the SAC will write a report to say that they feel that you are ready um, to be uh, recommended for a CCT. The JCST will look at all the information provided to them. They'll check that they've got outcome ones for ARCPs for every day of your training and an AR, ARCP outcome six and all the appropriate reports together. And if that's all in place, they will then refer your application to the GMC to recommend you for a CCT. You need to do an online form as well and you need to pay for it because if you don't, it won't be processed. And then if that all falls into place, you'll be put on the specialist register. You have to apply for your certificate. If you haven't applied for your certificate within 12 months of your CCT date, you will not get one and you will not go on the specialist register. Okay. So that's really, really important because it's very easy to think I've done all the paperwork, I've paid, but if you haven't actually made the final application, you won't go on the specialist register. If the 12 months is up, you won't, go, you, you won't get a CCT, you'll have to go through the CESA route which is the route which those people undertake if they haven't gone through a formal training programme in the UK. So you can apply for your consultant job within six months of your expected CCT date. So you can make that application. You can go for the interview within six months. But you cannot be appointed to a substantive post unless you are on the specialist register. Okay. So even if you're appointed and they <coughs> offer you the job and you start the job, you're effectively starting it as a locum because you cannot hold a substantive post unless you're on the specialist register. People talk about doing locum jobs when they're still training in their final year. You cannot do a locum consultant post in your final year of training. You can act up as a consultant, and that's called an acting up consultant post, and you're only allowed to do that for three months within the last six months of your training with prior approval by your, your dean or your HEE region and the JCST. And furthermore, you cannot act up in a post, that didn't, in a post that didn't previously exist. So you can only act up where, for instance, someone's on, on, on sick leave or maternity leave or sabbatical. You cannot act up in a post that they've just created because maybe you're going to get the substantive later. You cannot act up in that post. The other thing to say is if you, are, if you are not in a full training post, but you're, you're working your way up through the CESA route, I don't know if anybody here is, there is no expected CESA date. And I've seen people apply for posts saying that their expected CESA date is such and such, therefore they can apply because they're within six months. There is no expected CESA date. You don't have a CESA till you have a CESA. Okay. So when you're looking at consultant jobs, what are you going to be looking for? Well... First of all, the thing to do, obviously, is look at the job description. Is it a job that you really want? And I would thoroughly recommend not applying for a job that you don't want. That may sound odd, but people do that because they get desperate and they think, oh my goodness, I'm coming to the end, I better find a job. And of course, it's important because actually without a job, you don't have a salary. And if you've got a mortgage and three kids and two cars, you need to pay for them somehow. But don't go for a substantive post that you don't want, because although it is true that there's now much more mobility between posts as consultants, you don't really want to be leaving in your first year. <laughs> Doesn't look good. Okay. Look at the facilities they have. I mean, for instance, if you're a robotic surgeon and that's what you want to do and they don't have a robot, that's probably not the job for you. 
yes? Do they have the right facilities for the type of practice that you want to do? It may be that they're about to get it, which is fine, and you can help them work towards it if that's what you want. Think about geography. You may have other halves. You may have dependents. I mean, I know someone who had a horse and really had to go where the horse could go. <laughs> it's really important work about geography. And in terms of geography also, is it easy to get to where you want, well, from where you want to live to where you want to work? Because most of us don't live on the doorstep of where we work. Most of us don't want to live on the doorstep where we work because you come across your patients in Sainsbury's. It's really not that comfortable. <laughs> so most of us will tend to live a little bit further away from where we work. So that's also important. Is there somewhere you want to live in that area? Also think about your colleagues. I, I know that Miss Hill said earlier that she took a job which I thought was very brave, where there was someone she didn't really get on with. I have to say I find that really difficult to do. She's really <coughs> brave to do that. Because you're going to be working with these people potentially for 30 years. If you don't get on with them, boy, are you going to be in trouble. <laughs> Um, and in fact, I've had someone come to ask me my advice about applying for a job because that person is looking for jobs. And I thought, why are you going for that job? You know they don't like you there. <laughs> you, you know they try to get rid of you. They'll only try and get rid of you again, but from a more substantive position. So think carefully about who you're going to be working with. And of course, personnel change. You might find you're going into a job where you like everybody and they, they all leave within two years. And that's just unfortunate. But generally speaking, go for a place where you know you're going to be happy. Because if you're happy, you will thrive. Think about service realignments. Um, I, I, I know a, a, a trainee who went, went for a job, very happy in the job, but hadn't looked far enough ahead because then they merged with another two trusts who he wasn't that happy with and he got moved which wasn't really where he wanted to be and he had to move house and all those things. So think about, look ahead, look at what the plans are in that day. And of course, plans always take many years to become, come into effect, but think about that as well. And if you're someone who's into teaching and into research, then obviously look at the facilities for those as well. People always talk about inside candidates. And even where there is an inside candidate or a sort of inside candidate, people say, of course, there isn't one. I don't think that hugely matters if you really want the job. Of course, it's a consideration to take into account. But actually, if you're the better person on the day, you might find they like you better than their inside candidate. And that has happened. On the converse, I'm aware of a, of, of a, um, a job interview where the, 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 the internal panel the established consultants in that unit really, really wanted a candidate who didn't perform that well in interview. And boy, did they have a fight with the, um, the, all the external people and the non-clinical people to try and keep that person in post. So it can work both ways. Think about whether you're going to be working cross-site. I work across two sites. I have a colleague who, for some surprising reason, is actually happy working across three sites. I suspect he may actually be working across four sites, but we don't look into that But because um, he's just, you know. But, but if you don't like that, or if, you're not very, if, if you don't like the idea of that, maybe that's not the job for you. And, and, and I also, I, I have a, um, a junior who I'm, who I'm slightly worried about, not, not in any way because of clinical practice, but because it's a junior who doesn't drive. And if that junior goes, goes ultimately for a consultant job where they're crossing more than one site, they're going to be living in a taxi the whole time. So that's a consideration as well. Look at the job description in terms of the number of PAs. Not all jobs are the, minimum, the, the average, if you like, 10 PAs. I've seen jobs advertised with 8 PAs. Just be careful. You're going to get paid less if you go for an 8 PA job because it's only 8 PAs. Just make sure you check it. Okay. And I know that can change too, but it's worth looking at. And people talk a lot about, well, should I or shouldn't I do a locum consultant post? We've already heard earlier this morning that it's sometimes a good idea to do a post-CCT fellowship. And I think in current um, climate, it's probably a very good idea in most cases to do a post-CCT fellowship to hone in your expertise so you can sell yourself as an expert in something. However, you don't have to. Some people prefer to go off and do a locum job so that they get their foot under the door of practicing as a consultant before going for the one they really want. That's okay as well, but what you don't want is several locum jobs, one after the other, for a long time, because that doesn't look good on your CV. So if you've done four or five years of having done five or six different locums, it just looks like you're drifting and you haven't really found a substantive job where they actually want you. Okay, so just think about that. And don't throw all your eggs in one basket. 
I know of someone who was, who was actually a very good surgeon who really, really, really wanted to work in a major teaching institution, a big academic unit, and only, only ever applied for the big academic units. And the jobs didn't come up that often and didn't get one. And five or six years down the line was working as an associate specialist, having got their CCT. Okay, so just be careful. And look at roughly how many people are being appointed into your chosen specialty. I mean, these, these are figures up until about 18 months ago. Um, and paediatric surgery um, looks like the figures are dropping, doesn't it? And I don't know how many of you want to be a paediatric surgeon, but there were not many appointed in 2016. That could be good or bad. That might mean there are more jobs coming up, or it might mean that it's closing up. And I know for sure, I know that somebody said they were vascular, that this year we predicted was the year that the numbers would start dropping, and they are. 2018. That's not on there, but there you go. So in preparing yourself, prepare your CV, make sure it's up to date, make sure you've got everything that's relevant on it, fill any gaps. There will be a job description, there'll be a person specification. If you don't fulfill that person specification, you're not even going to get shortlisted. So make sure you fill in all the gaps. Be up to date in your specialty. Be up to date in current medical affairs and current political things related to medicine, or particularly surgery, I suppose. And ask, find your referees. Now, a little tip here. If you go to someone and say, will you be my referee? And they say, I'd suggest you ask someone else. Take that advice. <laughs> I know someone who didn't, OK? Because they really, really wanted this well-known, um, well-established person to be their referee. But if they don't like you, there's no point having their reference. OK? All right. And I would, I would send, you, send them your CV. So I've, had, I've been asked to write references for people, and, I, and they haven't worked for me for two and a half years. And I don't know all these fantastic things they've done in the last two and a half years. Always send your up-to-date CV so that they can then crow about you. They, they know what you've done. <laughs> And the college, as you know, will send out political updates. They're worth reading, particularly just before you go to an interview. And we also send out specialty updates as well. And I think we cover most specialties now. Um, so you get some up-to-date uh, um, literature about what's going on in your field. So when you're applying, read the job description and then read it again. Make sure you haven't missed anything. And then look, how many operating lists does it have? How many clinics does it have? How many sites does it cover? You know, are you covering a, a sort of covering paediatric surgery in your specialty? Are you trained to do that? <laughs> are you covering community services as well? Are you happy doing that? How many SPAs are there? How many DCCs are there? Now, I would say, and I think most of us at the college would say, you cannot do a job that has less than 1.5 SPAs in it. Because you need those to do the things you have to do, like mandatory training and audit and keeping up to date and a bit of CPD. You can't do those without a minimum of 1.5 SPA. So if your job has less than that, how are you going to function in that job? Look at the weekends. Look at the on-call frequency. Are the weekends split? So in other words, are you doing a, a, a one in six, but actually a week, every weekend split, so you're really wrecking every third weekend instead of every six? And I know that these job plans can change. They can't change it for the first three months, by the way, and not without your approval, your, without your agreement, although they do time bend your arm about it. But if you, if you think about it in um, the way medical management goes at the moment, it's unlikely to change for the better. So go for a job that you're content with on the grounds that it might change for the worse. OK? So. Look for the college badge. So all the job descriptions are looked at by our advisors. And if we approve them, they get the college badge. If they haven't got the college badge, you should be asking why. And you can ask the college, and the college will tell you why, why we haven't approved it. And that's worth knowing, because we might not have approved it, say, because it's only got half an SPA or something, or because we think it's an inappropriate balance of this, that, and the other in the programme. So it's always worth asking. And that's what the badge looks like. <coughs> if you don't see that, I would be suspicious. That either it's not a proper job or it, there's something wrong with it. Okay. 
so, as you know, there's uh, essential and desirable criteria. You have to fulfil the essential criteria, obviously, or you won't get shortlisted. It's helpful, from your point of view, to fulfil as much of the desirable criteria as possible, but you don't have to fulfil it all. It may be you excel in some of it, and therefore you don't need to have necessarily tick the boxes in some of the other things. <laughs> don't worry too much about that. It's really important that you visit beforehand. You may have to go more than once, and don't pester anyone who says, no, I don't want to see you. If you piss anybody off, they'll tell their friends. Okay. When you go and visit, you use that as a learning exercise as well as a selling exercise, so that you can use the information you've gleaned on your visit, potentially in your interview. Show that you know the place. Show that you understand where the problems might lie, um, and that you understand how you personally can help to improve those things. So you're using it as an as a, a information finding exercise as well as an information giving exercise. You don't only, if you think about it, you don't necessarily only need to speak to the people on the panel because everybody's going to speak to everybody else. So for instance, in, in vascular surgery, you might need to go and speak to one of the interventional radiologists and the nephrologists because we work fairly closely with them. And in fact, when I went for the job that I'm in now, I mean, it just so happened I had worked there, from what I, what I understand, and I didn't even know this had happened, Matron had gone to speak to my now senior colleague and said, if you don't appoint her, you're making a big mistake. And Matron wasn't on the panel, Matron just happened to like me. That goes back to what Miss Hill said about being nice to nurses, doesn't it? <coughs> so, try, so try and use it as an information greening exercise, but Remember, you're still on show. Don't show them your weak belly, okay? I know someone who sort of went to one of these visits and said, well, between you and me, you know, I'm a bit unhappy about this. And of course, they didn't get appointed, did they? <laughs> because you say that to the person who's going to interview you unofficially before the interview, they're going to remember that in the interview. Just be careful, you're still on show. And that also means dress smartly. Don't turn up in your jeans. So, the interview. Nowadays, you're more than likely to have to provide a presentation. It'll be predetermined. They'll tell you what it's got to be on. They'll tell you how long it should be for. Stick to the time and stick to the point. I've been on a number of AAC panels where they've overrun and they've just cut them off. So they've missed the punchline. That doesn't look good. And it also sets you off rather badly if you haven't managed to give your whole presentation and then you're thrown straight into the interview. So practice, practice, practice. Make sure you answer the question and try and bring in local issues if you can and if it's relevant to the question they're asking you to talk about. Obviously, you can't if it, you, if it doesn't. And try not to use these little prompt cards because, you know, it doesn't look good if you don't know what you're talking about. I know we all get nervous and sometimes it's helpful to have a prompt card. I mean, I'd be happier if I could see that screen there rather than having to turn around and look at what I'm trying to remember to tell you. But you're, you're selling yourself. It's a pitch. If you ever watch that programme, Dragon's Den, they don't come with prompt cards. If they came with prompt cards, they wouldn't get the money. Same, same applies to getting the job. So who's on the panel? There's always a lay member, and that's quite often the trust chairman or the trust chairman's representative. There's a college assessor who will be the external assessor effectively, who will be a consultant within your specialty. There's a chief executive or their representative, the medical director or their representative. There'll be someone from within the department and there may be more than one of those. And if it's a university associated or teaching place, there may be a university representative. And there's usually someone from HR who may or may not ask you questions, but is certainly there to take notes. Okay. There may be quite a big panel. I can remember when I was interviewed, there were something like 12 people on the panel, which I found slightly daunting. Um, but there must be a local majority and a medical majority. Okay. And if there's not, that's not a properly constituted panel. So what do we do as college assessors? Well, we are involved in the shortlisting process. And sometimes we have to remind the trusts of that. I was involved in an AAC panel a few months ago, and, and they sent me the list of people who they shortlisted. I said, hang on a second, I'm involved in the shortlisting, start again. Okay. So the college assessor is involved in the shortlisting. And what we're really there to do is to check that you match the, the job description, the essential criteria, and that you are fully trained and competent. That's what we're there for. 
and also to provide exter externality and see fair play during the course of the interview and the whole interview process. And we write a report that goes back to the college every time we sit on a panel. Okay. So when you're there, you're all going to be terribly professional. You're going to look confident, measured. You're not going to be thrown by a question. You're not going to say um and ah too often. You're going to look us in the eye and answer the question directly. Don't fidget. I can remember being slightly irritated by a candidate who sat there in the chair in front of us, waving his foot up and down like this all the time and not looking us in the eye. And I know it's because he was nervous. Couldn't help it. Try not to do it. Okay. And answer the question. If you need to practice, practice. So what type of questions might you be asked? Well, obviously the college assessor is going to ask you a little bit about what training you've done, the competencies you've met, maybe the numbers of cases you've done in, in key operations, uh, where you've done your training, that sort of thing. Possibly when your CCT is, if you haven't got it yet, that sort of question. The clinicians are going to be looking at your clinical skills. They're going to be asking you what you can bring to the department, perhaps where you've learnt that, what numbers you've done in that. Please don't lie, we've all heard of the case that where the surgeon was struck off recently where he lied about how many cases he'd done. The medical director is going to look in, be looking at questions regarding revalidation, perhaps about governance, about dealing with clinicians. They might ask you questions of where you've made a mistake. Be honest about it. What did you do? They want to see that you reflect on your practice. They might be asking you about I mean, a question I quite often hear is what are your weaknesses? And I have to say, and I say this to people going to who are applying for medical school as well. Your weakness is not the reverse of something you're very good at. Okay? In other words, you, when people ask you what are your weaknesses, oh, one of my weaknesses is I work really, really hard and I can't stop working really hard. That is not what they're asking for. They're asking for a genuine weakness. Because right? that's just rubbish, really, isn't it? Saying, well, I work really, really hard and, and that's, that's a real weakness of mine. Or oh, I'm so devoted to my patients, that's a real weakness of mine. That's not what we're looking for. We want to know that you've reflected on what you're really like as a person. Okay. The chief executive is also going to be looking about your teamwork and whether you have any strategic ability, because obviously what he wants is, or he or she wants is for you to take that, help take that department forwards. Um, the lay person is going to be looking about patient safety issues, about your communication skills, and might ask you direct um, specific questions about that, whether you've had issues with patients and things like that in the past. And the university rep, rather obviously, is going to perhaps ask you about teaching and research and what you hope to achieve there and, and whether the facilities are, are what you were expecting, that sort of thing. So at the end of the interview, you'll be given the opportunity to ask questions. Don't ask a question you've just been given the answer to five minutes ago just because you feel you have to ask a question. Better not to ask a question. Don't prove you weren't listening. Okay? All right? Um, and don't, please, 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 don't use that time to negotiate your start date, your accommodation, what the on-call rotor is. I've seen people do it. It's embarrassing. Just say, no, thank you, you've answered all my questions, or you've answered all my questions in my pre-interview visit, or no, thank you, I'm very happy, thank you. Do the negotiation after you've accepted the post. Yeah. I know someone who went into an interview, um, in fact, interviewed at the same time I was, it wasn't actually for a consultant post, but for, for a registrar post, who went, we, we both went into the interview, we, I came out, I went back in, they offered me the job, I said, yes, thank you. He went in, he came out, he made a phone call, and he went back in again, and I thought, what's going on here? And he said, I had to go and ask my wife whether it was okay to take the post. I thought, why didn't you ask her before you left home this morning? <laughs> <laughs> kind of stupid. <laughs> but these things happen. Just be sensible about it. Okay, and if you're told to wait, well actually, if, if you're told to wait, don't go too far. I went to one interview and they, we, we got through the interviews slightly quicker than we anticipated and they wanted to bring back in the two, <coughs> two people they were going to offer the posts to. Um, they called one back in and offered it to him and they, and they called the other one and he wasn't there and so they phoned him and he said, well he'd just gone down to town to go to the shops and <laughs> it would take him half an hour to get back and would we mind waiting? <laughs> so don't, if you're told to wait, don't go too far. And at the end of the interview and if they've offered you the job, don't overdo the thank yous, 
I mean, it, it, it can be quite embarrassing sometimes when people go around grabbing you by both hands and saying thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody. Just professional distance. Thank you very much. Okay, so if you succeed, well done. You've done it. You've won your prize. Um, then you've got the next ladder to climb up, haven't you? Um, if you don't, ask for feedback because that would be really helpful for the next interview you go to. Just because you didn't get the job doesn't mean you weren't appointable. That applies for anything you apply for. It just means there's only one job and somebody else did slightly better than you. Okay? It doesn't mean that they didn't like you. So ask for feedback. It might be the feedback was, well, the other person just did that marginally bit better than you or whatever. But sometimes constructive feedback can help you for your next interview. And keep going. If you're on the specialist register or, get, or, or heading towards it in a very positive way, you are appointable. You'll find a job somewhere. Not, not, not running customs, though, as, as a surgeon. So, congratulations when you get your job. Thank you. <laughs>